I will start my questions by trying to understand a little bit about your involvement of the NPFL. Um, from your testimony, you told us that you joined the NPFL around January of 1990. Is that correct? No. Could you please clarify? I then recall the day that John MPFL. Uh, I couldn't remember the specs, the the particular day, but what I said was when MPFL entered January 1st, 1990, in Campley, it was a time that three days after they are still in Campley, it was a time that we left Campley when the war got serious. That's what I said. And we were in the bushes for some time from Bader Clay, where we finally arrived with the family, where the place had left before going on the training base. But uh, it has still some time because I think it was after a month uh, from there, because at that time there was an uh, infighting between the MPFL within the MPFL between Prince Johnson and some of the other special forces. And right after that infighting when the MPFL remained stable was the time that went on base to ball play base. But the particular date and time that what I can tell you. Thank you. But at least we I was around February, March like yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, at that time I'm sure it was around February. February, okay. Yeah, because by March we were fighting in Ganta. At that time, according to our definition of a child, this under 18 or under is the definition that we have used. So by that definition, would you have considered yourself to have been a child soldier? I know that's one of the basis in which people try to establish when all the my year thing were coming and how many year old I was when I was born and all of that. Uh, one thing that I want for this commission to know and for the Liberian people to know, I went on a training base by my own volition. Nobody forced me to take me into a training base. And I went there, I volunteered there. It was not something that somebody forced me to, to take me. Oh no, that point you've already stated to us and I understand it clearly. But I'm just going by the did you give an interview testimony to the UN? I mean, not the UN. Um, it was an interview that you conducted uh, with the UNDP around May 2005. Do you remember that interview? Father? You had an interview with the UNDP consultant during the time of doing a conflict mapping. Do you remember that interview? It was around 2005. No. It was a Nigerian lady that talked with you. Nigeria? Nigerian lady. Where? She interview here in Liberia. No, I can't anyway, remember. Anyway, we have records here that on May 19th, you gave the interview to her. And in that interview is where I got the statement that you were 18 when you joined the revolution, page 11. And in 2005, I may not remember the specific interview that you talking about, but I believe they were doing the political period. Uh, there were several press publications that I have at that time uh, during the campaign period, which I uh, know that during the war was some of the questions asked, even like some of the questions that I'm hearing today about cash or how I got work and all of that. Uh, okay. At that time, I was a national chairman. In fact, up to today, as I said earlier, a national chairman for uh, the National Patriotic Party, a former, a former ruling party. So it was, it was not nothing new. Everybody wanted to hear what I would say, what I would say about the war and what was my own party, party, uh, participation and all of that. So there were a lot of things I was said. And okay, I understand. If you ask questions that I remember, I can say, I can answer to it. All right, I, I understand. I um, what I'm concerned about is, is more your, your mindset with regards to your joining the MPFL at that time. Was it more, you said already you were not forced, so it means you had a motivation 
a self motivation for joining would you share with us what that motivation was was it more patriotic you thought that your country needed to have a change and you wanted to be a part of that revolution or was there a personal reason somebody of yours was killed and you wanted a chance to get involved or was it social in a sense that you felt protection was necessary could you help us to understand in your own words how do you, what would you think was your motivation for joining though you were not forced as a young boy at that time uh, sorry it looked like you are not here when i did my introductory statement no i did hear about your uncle and somebody that got killed and all of this but was that the only thing if that's it then no problem you don't have to repeat it i've said in that statement that people of Nima County joined the revolution, especially the NPFL for serious reasons, uh, best known to them. And I told you my reason why I joined the NPFL. After which period I joined the NPFL, I said that in my statement. Okay. Uh, right. If you have a copy of that, I'll read it later then. I won't waste your time on that. Okay. If we can get a copy of your statement. Thank you. Then I'll go to my next question. Um, were you satisfied with your involvement in the MPFL, considering that motivation that you had, and you went through the whole process, right? Because I think you were one of those that disarmed in 2003. I said I several times. Okay. And so were you satisfied with your total involvement in the process over those 13 years? If you say if I was satisfied, I would say yes. Okay. I never have any regret. Right, being a part of an NPFL and I've been very clear about that the only regret that I have is the amount of people that die in the Liberian civil crisis as a whole even from NPFL UNSA and all of that but for my involvement especially I rolling through from Nima County looking at NPFL as our friend and indeed today some things I couldn't even easily be said at that time to call yourself in Bali and all of that today I can boast of it that I'm from Nima and proud of say it in any gathering even locally and internationally for me to regret my involvement is no okay thank you next could you share with me if you could succinctly you know very simple what were your greatest achievement in the MPFL history and your most great your greatest nightmare your greatest painful situation. You did mention that the death toll and the suffering was bad, but was there something personal that you can remember that really shocked you in a way? Those two things, something great and something painful and difficult. No, I didn't get that question clear. Are you asking my own painful experience? Or? Personal, of course. Everything is with you, personally. Yeah, yeah. but I, I, I said, I've said it. Mm -hmm. uh, it looked like we are going right back. I've said it. Maybe I, I, didn't hear I, that. I told this commission that before I joined the NPFL, that was a problem. And the problem which I've stated was uh, involvement of the AFL uh, in joining our. No, I'm not talking about the before. I'm saying during the time, 1990, from the time you joined to 2003, when you're finished, if you reflect now, what was the greatest achievement? The greatest achievement was I was able to build 50 houses or the. The difficult point was my neighbor's son died in front of me. You know, what was the greatest and the worst that you can experience, you can remember? Okay, I think you say my during the time I was already member of the Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of things that happened. Just one. The, the horses and all of that are something that just came yesterday. Okay. Uh, but during my period within the MPFL, I was successfully able to be among the few that were successful in battle. Battle. Most of the war, it sounded like it was in one rolling duo that was fighting all. Who catch up Banga rolling duo? Who re catch up Bombing rolling duo? Who re catch up Bobolo rolling duo? Uh, I believe that the aim of which I was with the organization, I had to accomplish it. It was not that because I was a stronger or because I'm stronger than all the fighters. No. And another achievement, why in the organization, I believe that 
that was a lot of time people said that Nima people can start things, they can't end it. They kind of talk that nearly all Liberians know and they used to joke us. Uh, I successfully started with the MPFL and I successfully ended it. Uh, Taylor agreed to leave from here by himself and he left from here saying it was for peace sake. At least I'm proud that uh, while as a general frontline commander, excuse me for the expression, I didn't leave here for them to catch another person so they can pee on him and say, Nima, people that you are depending on here where you ended it. Uh, I believe that that was a very achievement that we had. Uh, the Hawks business and property, anybody can acquire that. I'll talk lengthily on it uh, from the deliberation between me and Madame Poo. But there was some work thing that happened. Work thing, work thing. That sometimes I just do not think that it's necessary for me to think about the war. That I should consider it as something that has been put behind us. There were certain period and time that I went on the front line that people that I consider personal friend to me, personal friend to me. We were sometimes three, four that went as commander and they were not able to survive to return. It was very, very terrible. And the next day I got to look at their brothers, their children and all of that. Uh, there was in a case a time that a man that I first considered close to in the former MPFL, the late Jim G. Oatley, uh, were ambushed when LPC first launched their attack, along with the late Ray Hay, he was a white man, that he and Maurice Cooper, the late Maurice Cooper, made their soul rest in peace, were, have, were having the ownership over RTI, dying in ambush. Uh, today, today, I still to go out with that kind of feeling, it, it really, really got to me. Even I will speak, uh, three of old late children been with me for more than 12 years now, and and they, they still live with me. I take them like uh, my own children. And except you tell them, even the younger one do not even know that I'm not his or biological father. And there were a lot of things that happened on that land that I felt it was very, very terrible. Thank you. Um, next one. I'm trying to understand the, the, the command structure of your organization. So please bear with me as we try to go through something and then you can For correct organization, for please. MTFL and later on the government structure from, 1990, from 1990 to 1996 or 7, it will be the MPFL structure or this, the so-called Greater Liberia military structure. And then from 1997 to 2003, it will be the government structure. So I'm trying to understand what roles did you play, for example, militarily during that time period? Like you joined in 1990, and so you started off probably as what, a, a buck private, or what was your first, did you have a first rank when you joined right away? Everybody was just a fighting man. Okay, so like a Even bus driver. If you were commanding a platoon or a squad or a company at that time, everybody was just a fighting man. Okay. I can really remember my first position. Of course, there were other rent and things, but rent to really hold to know that I had some level of authority within the MPFL was when I became the chief of staff of the Navy. Chief uh, of staff? Yeah, of the Navy. Of which place? Navy, Navy. Of the Division, Navy. And what year was that, please? That was 95. Mm -hmm. Okay, so prior to that, you were more holding a just everybody fighter type situation. I was commanding true fighters, commander, the cop CEO, sometimes commanding officer, and all of that. So you've always been in the command, uh, what they call, uh, front line, uh, battlefront commander yes, type position. Exactly. Okay. And then after your CEO in the Navy in 95, what happened next? What was your next promotion? Before uh, your the chief of staff at that time, the MPFL was like the higher rank. Highest rank. Yeah, the higher rank. The highest was the four star, which was chairman or joint chief of staff. So when I reached the rank 
of a chief of staff. Uh, that way I remain until the war ended mm -hmm. when we disarm. Okay, and so you say the person above you, what was that title again? Chairman of Joint Chief of Staff. Chairman of Joint Chief of Staff. And who was that chairman, please? Uh, the former commander, former deputy commanding general that came here, John Tia, was one jo point in town. John Tia? John Tia. Tia, okay. One point in town, chairman of John Chief of Staff. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dobo Mekazon also served that position. Okay. Google me. Uh, Francis Mewon also served that position. Mewon. The folks among all of them were the late General ACS Musa. Musa. I served as Chairman of John Chikosta. Okay, so there's Isaac Musa, Francis Nyawa, and who was that third person? Do Dogo? Dogo Makazo. Dogo Makazo. And then John Tia yeah. was the last one. When you, let's say 1995, 96, but you got promoted to that position in 95, right? Yeah. So let's say in 95, 6, who was the person at that time? Uh, I think that was John Tia. John Tia, okay. So then ahead of that position would be who? The person that would be ahead of that position, maybe the defense minister. Minister of Defense. Okay, and because at that time the MPFL or having MPFL and have the MPRA team. Yes, okay. MPRA Okay. So then that minister now reported directly to the president. Yeah. Okay, so it will be the president, the former president Charles Taylor. It depends. Taylor. Sometimes the president invited his favorite chief of staff and he talked to them directly. Ah. Sometimes he asked them to make certain report to the chairman or joint chief of staff. Okay. And it, not, it was not banning that it must be the defense minister or through the defense minister. Mm -hmm. It was not normal military procedure. Mm -hmm quote unquote or conventional army. Okay. And this same procedure was used after ninety seven when the government was elected, in a sense, the Minister of Defense, the Chief of Staff, and then below. Yeah. Did they still have that joint chief of staff as an intermediate position? Yeah. Even in the government time? No. Uh they have the position until the disarmament process. Correct. The disarmament process are referring to it was a disarmament before the uh, 97 election mm -hmm. that elected president to uh, excuse me uh, that elected former president Charles Taylor to presidency uh, that, that was this armament and all the warring fashion then were banned okay okay so then let's say after this armament 1997 you talked about being employed at an NPA National Port Authority right did you have also a rank in the military during that time from 97 to 2003, especially, for example, after the war started with Lurd and Model? Uh, 97, when I was appointed, it was a presidential appointment. Uh, it was not just within the employed of the port. Mm. Uh, most of the time, from the port own record, sometimes the director of security is appointed by the president. And sometimes the board recommend uh, they take that position very important in the board. I think if other people here have been working in the board know that even the present directors are there, the two that Madam Sally had changed, she made pronouncement of self appointing them. Uh, there was no military job then. As a director of security, there we were kept fully carrying on a police function. Okay. And it was safety security department then. After my time at the board and knowing their function and responsibility and having adequate police power, we ran beyond the documentation that finally brought a state of, a full police state to the National uh, Board Authority uh, Security, changing the nomenclature from safety security department to Liberia Sea Port Police. So at the higher rank within the military was uh, Colonel. 
colonel. Yes, out of my bed, the people that have that position, that's the rank they have. You had a colonel position then? Is that what you said? Pardon? Did you say you had a colonel position? Yes. Oh, okay. Everybody that is sent to that position, uh, the director of security, they are rank in the paramilitary is a colonel. Okay. What I'm concerned about, you, I remember earlier you said that during the 1997 to 2003, when they learned model wars were going on, that you had some kind of field position, some kind of inspector or general after the overseer? After the 1997 election, 97-98, we worked at the board and 99, I was still in the board, in fact until 2003. But the front line girl, thanks when the law was started in 99, late 99. Mm -hmm. So by 2002, I was around the front line. And in that same 2002, the middle of the enemy, I had some more responsibility as general front line supervisor. Okay. Okay. Okay, next I want to um, ask you some questions on economics issues before I come back. I noticed from your presentation um, that before 1997, you didn't really work in Liberia per se to get income. You said you were a volunteer for the MPFL and that whole period you basically gave your services free. Of course, they may have given you some small thing for, for food and survival. Is that basically correct? Father? Is that basically correct that before 1997, you had not worked in Liberia to generate any income per se? A business or some, something like that? Yeah. Okay. So from 97 now is when most of your wealth producing status started from 1997. Yeah. And I noticed you said that you worked with the port from 1997 to 203 as director of security. Yeah. And the comment you made shows me you were making approximately 3000 to $5,000 a month there from benefits, everything together. Around there. Okay. And then you were frontline commander, which may have given you some other remunerations there too. Then I noticed you also talked about having your private security firm. Yeah where while you were working full time with the government, your private security firm allowed you to carry on certain big contracts, yeah. like the OTC yeah. contract, where you were making about 5000 a month. Yeah. How no, long did that contract 5000 not a month. What? I said quarterly. Oh, quarterly. Yeah. Okay, and how long did they pay you that amount of money? Uh, two, two years. <laughs> two years. If I'm not mistaken, two or two and a half years. Okay. Then Until you OTC closed in 2002, from the time they came in 2000. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. Not in 2000. Not okay, then you also talked about this Freedom Gold company that you worked as a security for, again, through your consultancy Consultant and a program officer. Okay, and you were making approximately $1,000 a month there, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, how long did that contract go? Uh, freedom Go contract was, I think, about a year okay. or a year and a month. Yes, around that period. I can't exactly tell, but okay, I understand. It, it's still some time. I understand. Then United Logging, you said you served as a security with them also. Consultant, yeah. Consultant, of course. And they paid you about 1005 plus but a month, bet right? Between 1000 thousand two. 2002. Yeah, because I was taking a quarterly cash from there too. It was not money, and it was sometimes three thousand, three thousand six. Okay. How long did that go on for? Until the war in the southeastern region that lasted for long. Until the the the, the tension um and that was around 2002, 2002. So about let's say four years, five years. It was three, three, three to three and a half years. Three to three and a half. Okay. Was there any other kind of income generating big contract you had besides those three? Yeah, I think these are the mayor one, but oh, okay. uh, those are the mayor one, but there were some businesses that I, I do the renting, running taxi, okay. and all of that, but that was the mayor one. 
Okay, then next, I noticed from your testimony that the property that you now have, from my rough calculations, at least a million dollars plus. You talk about 33 to 40 different apartment units throughout the country and throughout the nation. Uh, just a rough calculation, using about 10,000 even a unit as an estimate or even 20,000 an estimate, it comes out to about a million plus dollars. Your asset value, your net worth as a person. Would you agree with that or feel it's less or it's too small? Or uh, I'm not really paying you to sit down to do a general calculation on what I have. Mm -hmm. uh, because some of the projects are still under construction. I understand. Uh, but the one that I fully completed at Dubo Road, the 13 apartment, uh, mm -hmm. it was estimated during the term of the project between fourteen to 17000 for each of the building. The reason I'm asking this kind of question is because from my calculation, to be worth a million dollars, even if you were being paid $11,000 a month, you would have to get that money for at least 10 years to be able to be worth a million plus dollars. But in your case, you got it in a much less time. So it gives me a feeling that you were having other sources of income or you were getting loans from a bank or something. Would you like to shed some light on that? Thank you very much. The, the calculation from my own, I have nothing I reach a million. If it will reach, fine. But during the period that I really work, it was not the same time that were constructing buildings and acquiring property. Mm -hmm. uh, they I said the first occupant of my house at Dupo Road is not a hidden place, everybody know. It was in 2003. Mm -hmm. And that project, a lot of time I think lasted for almost two years before we completed it. The calculation of building material and all other things at this time, it's, it's expensive. That's why more people venture in real estate because instead of depreciating, the value increase at time. Uh, at that time, we were buying steroid around six dollars. Steroid is around twelve fifty thirteen dollars for now. Bag of cement. At that time, that I said I bought most of my cement from OTC. The imported cement. And they used to give it a Bob Taylor to sell it. You can find it up yourself. They were selling it there in OTC for five dollars forty cent. And now, cement in Morovia is around twelve dollar thirteen fifty. And sometimes when you can find it up to seventeen dollars. So most of the things we acquired then was on that line. And sometimes I used to tell OTC, give me some of my cash and give me some in cement. So most of my cement and most of my property, uh, especially when it comes to the construction work, the cement came from that land. It was not something where you got to particularly take cash and buy the cement, except where I got to mortgage some of my own salary or some of my own uh, uh, benefit to get cement. There are certain things I need to buy that will compost with the steel rod, zinc, and other. I understand. Um, my calculation, by the way, was based on low cost. It was assuming of that time cost, not the present time. But I was wondering, so basically you took no loans in doing this kind of thing. And um, we heard that during this period there was a lot of work with regard to mining, illicit mining, diamond gold selling and logging, so you were not involved in any of these issues, is what you're saying. Your money just came from your income. Well, man, I believe that you are investigating the situation in Liberia sufficient. If somebody accused me that I dug diamond in Wiswa, or I dug gold in, in Sano, I live by this time, you should be clear, because you've been studying all of Commissioner Ben Stating, so and so down, so and so area, somebody accused you of that. It's, it will not be something that someone will be hiding it. It's clear enough, and you can find out from yourself. No, we uh, do have that kind of allegation on you on our file, but I just want to hear from you personally. I'll so, say yes, no. Know. Okay, thank you. No. All right, that's all. And you made no loans, so it was just somehow your personal magic money. 
Exactly. Right. If Thank if you. if you want further explanation, I will just say no. If you want further explanation, I will say that most of what I got was by my own determination to be able to save knowing the background that I came from, that at least I can develop it. And even up to today, you and myself speak, if you drive down that SKD Boulevard, I have not let a year to go without trying to do small things on some of my projects. Would you say that other uh, commanders were get doing similar things like you working with the government full time and having private businesses generating huge funds of money like this? Or I, you were just one of those unique ones? I don't know what they are thinking was. Uh, but I don't think it was a problem a lot of time if you register a private security and find a management team for it or if you decide to to serve as a consultant for a private business, uh, I have not see it against the constitution that because I work with government, I never have that right to do that. But if it's something that is illegal, it was something that I don't know about. But if other commanders decide to take advantage uh, of opportunity and fold it, then I would say I don't know about them, but I know about myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The next thing I'm concerned about is the issue of the struggle between the, um, the Nimbarians and the Grandidians. In your testimony, you talked about it as a tribal war issue and so at a certain time in the conflict period, especially you were concerned that the period from 1998 to 1992 was more of a tribal thing, but after that it changed its flavor as more people got totally involved into the various organizations. So what I'm concerned about is during that period where it was this so-called tribal conflict, in your opinion, what would be the foundation of that conflict? You know, there's something in, in military where you talk about first strike, you know? It's like two persons, two brothers having a struggle. When the parents come to the picture, they usually the first question they will ask is, who hit a friend first? And the person who hit a friend first, then they will hold that person responsible. So in your case, when you look at this struggle now between your, the people of the, this area, who would you say was first strike? When I started my deliberation, especially on the historical perspective, I said a similar thing almost to your question. When I try to draw out the war, mm -hmm. like sometimes I don't want to put my mind on this war situation, especially when it comes to the Nigerian and the Nibadian. There was one thing that nobody could easily preempt because Queen uh, Pai and Do, besides being friendly, they strongly believe in our home that there is a treaty that exists between the crime and the kill. And any old man that you sit with, with and the Nima people, any old man that you sit with, will tell you that they are not sort of waste each other blood. And that belief is among our people, uh, which they even call each other seer, which means brother-in-law and all of that. They don't really look like people that sort of fight each other. But what I put in Morovia that the Nibadi got involved in, I would say they were in track into it. There were two friends from Grand Gila and Nima, the Kuyongpa and Do. They met each other here, nobody know where they started their friendship from, and I don't know how deep they was and how close they were. And they claim themselves as people that really carry on the coup and all of that. I don't know if that information is true or not, but history says we should accept that it's true. And as far as our own research is concerned, it's like Kriyongpa was a high school graduate among the 17 listed men. He was the only high school graduate among them. And at one point in time, he was even asked to become the head of state, which he refused, and decided to become the commanding general to control the army. So I don't know where the two friend problem came from. But at the end of the day, Nibadians saw themselves into it, and Grandidians saw themselves into it. It extends, uh, and to the extent that the amount of people that died from Neymar, we cannot sit there and say, yes, they are 1,000, 2,000. We can't get total account of that. The same thing happened to the Grandidians. So it's not a, 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 a conventional war where somebody will sit down and say they may fire for it. 
Amen. Fire last and all of that. But to really find out if you want for us to answer your question, uh, do not leave uh, when Queen Pa came against Do and stated his own reason why he came against Do. Uh, I believe, I don't know, you can investigate and prove, but I believe, as a person, that there was no blush here until when a coup failed. I never heard about any minister that was killed. I never heard about any vice president that was killed. I never heard about any army commander that was killed at that time. But after the coup failed, the Nibalians suffered the weight most. So if this guy you're talking about is who decide to overthrow their friend or who decide to kill their friend, then from uh, there you can get the understanding. <laughs> what do you think about it? Yeah. If I'm sitting there, I'm analysis. president, and then you can't you say you want to kill me? But what do you think? Even if you miss the bullet, the bullet missed me. What do you say? Was, it, <laughs> was, was this information really something that was verified? Was they investigated? Because we believe that even when I decided to do some of my research, I believe that the most talk about who were doing two period. Uh, everybody wanted to kill two. Everybody wanted to kill two. I don't know for what reason. There were several schools that were announced against two, including the one he himself announced and any other president. So were all true or was it for what caused me by leaving the country? Was it the right decision that the president may allow time to change the commanding general to secretary general and all of that? I think from your own investigation, you will indicate. But to say the person was fourth, the person was second, the person was the last to kill, saying you did the appeal my death and all of that, I cannot answer all from. Okay, thank you. I respect that. Okay. Um, another one. Do you believe there is such a thing as a non-violent way to change a corrupt bad government yes example please Mohammed Mohammed Adi uh, Martin Luther King stated that he worked on that today we can see it in America mm -hmm. and I mean for Africans now I'm not talking about for foreign people for African yeah for African people I don't know if I can set the Mandela situation as a scenario but what happened to Mandela he was jailed for some time and all of that and I don't know if the president that was in power was not willing to free him was he was was he going to have the opportunity to go for election but I say I can say that the the the, the Mandela situation should be another example because oh. matter was very very deadly Okay, so that's a good model you're saying, that the model of being a sacrificial lamb for change, for social revolutionary change, is the best model as compared to first strike. I believe so. Mm. So would you say then that MPFL made the best decision by deciding to use the first strike instead of the sacrificial lamb position? But I think MPFL was the first to strike. I had not said that. Oh. Is that your conclusion that we want for to dwell on and... Well, I'm just looking at the certain facts, and for example, 1989, the but attack the on the government. But the war came before 89. Something no, brought about the war. Forget the one in uh, in the one in 85. I'm talking about after that. That was calmed down. Everything was stable, and we had a government. And now, bang! We saw December around the same year time of the year, the MPFL forces entered into Liberia with guns after being trained properly in Libya to come and overthrow a legitimately standing president. Mr. Commissioner, when you say stable, I don't know which... No, not stable. Take uh, that word out. Yeah, I Just don't know which situation and you, bringing you guns consider to stable. Overthrow. Stable may be very... Yeah, correct. Uh, take out the stable. The situation you consider stable because maybe at that time you are in... No, that was it. Take out stable. I was right here in Morovia. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay, take out stable. Okay, things with you. It may not be what we're holding in Nima. Okay. But if you say why the MPFL decide to fight, uh -huh. believe, That's the key point. Yeah, I believe that that President Blau or yeah, he's a special forces commando. Uh, he know how their revolution came. I think other will come and okay. he will be willing to that. fully explain Thank to you. you what they did. That, but while my own involvement in it is what I'm trying to explain. No, I was just trying to get your personal view, but I understand you prefer to let the people answer directly mm -hmm. and not put your own feelings into it. So I respect that. I'll go on to my next question. Um, 
Now, you had said earlier that um, you personally have not committed any violations during this period, 79 to 2003. Do you still stand by that statement? Seriously. Okay. So, for example, though looting, mass looting, destruction of public property, um, forced labor, sexual slavery, these things are also considered violations. If somebody but, personally attributes me to NRA, I should be held liable. Mm, okay, so you stand by that commitment Seriously. that you personally have not committed one iota of any wrongdoing. And nobody say I raped them, you can bring them. Okay. In fact, they can take me into court. Okay, then next, let's Beside look at process. responsibility and accountability factor. Though you may not have personally done something, from what you told me earlier, your position was like the number three position in the MPFL or government structure at the time. So when these violations were being committed, and if we're looking for accountability and responsibility over and above the direct person who did it, then do you at least accept responsibility from that fact that you held the third highest position of military power in this country during that period? Then what happened to the president I hold a higher power? No, the president by you will answer his own question. <laughs> the chief of the chief of the, the, the chairman of the chief of staff, he will answer his part of question. We're on you today. The defense minister too. Uh -huh. All of them we can't answer their part of question. We're coming to them too. But Thank today are your day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody can deny the way in which things took play in this country. People die, people lost their lives. But all I want to say to this commission and to the Liberian people, we shall stand by if I personally committed a crime against somebody, it's not a TRC process alone. If you get hurt and you want to take it anywhere, I will say that I will be willing to defend myself because I'm clear in my own mind that I never did such. No, but we already the got that. The institution that I associated uh -huh. with, there is a lot of things that happen that even up to today, I don't know some. Mm. Maybe I'm always listening to the TRC, will be able to listen to some. But for me to say I take a blanket responsibility or something that I don't Not blanket, know, partial. But how we are to that when well, I don't even know shared responsibility. You were the commander. You so were the chief of staff. In case I don't do it, and all of did it. And the same people you are inviting them here. And they serve as chief of staff, so I should take responsibility. Okay, so you say why you, you want me to say then I say we take the responsibility because I associated with the former MPF and the former governor of Liberia. Okay, so in summary, you're saying that you share, you feel you should not be held responsible at all. I feel First strongly all, that people that that, that committed some responsibility, uh, some crime, if you call them, they will be able to tell you what they did. But if at a leadership level, mm -hmm. because our one head of the former GOL mm -hmm. uh, forces, and uh, because I became an MPF chief of staff, and that's a shared responsibility, I would say I agree because these are positions uh -huh. that I Thank you. He's on the record now. Let me at least yeah. hear that part. So you confirm that you share responsibility is as a commander. Is, is that what your explanation That's is. what I'm concerned yes, about. Exactly. Okay, now with that shared responsibility, does your heart move you at this time to say anything to the people of Liberia who lost their lives and suffered during this war because of the shared responsibility that you are receiving now. What may I say in my closing program, not only the people that lost their property, their life and all of that. I told you one of my worst experience was when the late Jinji Oble was ambushed and all of that and sometimes friends are go with me on the front when they cannot return with me and they got to die there i also extend the sympathy to their family in the liberian way to tell them sorry and even people that are fought against not the civilian alone there are some people that are fought against and some of the information i have now especially treaty and thing that exists between the body and other people since i started my research like the I have to apologize to them and tell them I'm sorry. It's not because I'm afraid of them. It's not because the crown people were stronger than my forces. Uh, that's what I'm saying. 
I'm saying there was no reason for the amount of people that die in the country to die. It was too much. It was beyond okay. my own imagination and expectation. Thank you. My last question then has to do with this thing called Operation Octopus. There was a time where Liberia's former president, Doe, I mean, Doe was killed, 1990. There was a period from 1991 and two where we saw a lot of struggles, but then it was calming down. Things were trying to go back to normal. There was an interim government on the ground. But then suddenly we saw this thing called Octopus. And it brought back the reflaming of the whole struggle to this country. Can you share with us what was the reason as a commander in the organization that brought this to Liberia? Why was that such a critical battle? Why was it necessary at that time to launch such an all right offensive against the people of this country after the so-called motivation and purpose of MPFL had been fulfilled and the former leader duo was killed? Uh, during the, the, the period on our review, of course, I was not a higher official within the MPFL to know why uh, Operation Autobus was launched. I believe there are a lot of senior commanders that have been coming here and that, that will stay calm. Uh, that at that time they were in a position to be able to answer that. But when I spoke earlier, uh, I said I agree with past speaker that gave some analysis of the root causes of the war in Liberia. And I try to point my own way around the denial of participation. Uh, being political participation or social participation. And when I started indicating that even the people believe that the whole Christianity should be the only hallmark uh, of worship in Liberia. And if Roland II were going to wear some kind of country jacket here today with two county in your hair, like some kind of culture dancer you can hear, everybody will start thinking that I can't to shine or the people will start running away from me because they believe that those things are devilish. Even my own traditional dancer that get their ordinary culture, they call him Gio Devil or they call them Gio Devil. And the word devil, you all know that. Uh, most of what happened was, I can't say around participation, the denial of participation. And so when like you look the at the, the government that came in during the transition period, it was something that most of the people that were involved in the war, didn't support it. If I can recall, I don't think it was during uh, the inner period that uh, Aze Musa came in time to represent the MPFL. That government, the MPFL, was not represented. I believe people that organized that government was aware that they would try to convince the MPFL. And knowing to themselves that MPFL has been a fighting force, if they can't convince them to join them, that means MPFL will fight them. So they should be willing to fight MPFL. I believe that was around power struggle and people not consenting to each other and people not being allowed to fully participate. I believe a lot of times even MPFL, their own recent purpose were not internationally known that people will accept them and say yes, there is a reason. But government will form. Thank you very much. I'm finished. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Witness. I have a few uh, questions. As I said earlier, my name is John Stewart. Did you at any time during your, you said you were assigned in, uh, in the Southeast, River says, Bassa, all these places. Did you at any time have bodyguards assigned to you by the name of JJ and Zachary Point? JJ? Yeah. Asking question were asked. JJs were one, if that is JJ from the Southeastern region, they were one of the unit commander uh, within 
But one of the sector commander within a unit called Jungle Lion in RTI. And you, he reported to you as commander? I said earlier that that unit was on their own until when I took over 95, when they were brought under the Navy Division at one of the brigade. And uh, you were also at one time in the in the Yanni district, Riverside. Yeah, I still in Riverside. I said. Did you any did you at any time order JJ and Zach Lepoin to dismantle a caterpillar in Bodo Town and put it on the head of people to take to Bo Town from Bodo Town to Bo Town? No. During my period uh, in that region, as I said earlier, the company that were working there were RTI and Maurice Cooper had that company and even up to today, Oscar Cooper and other people that serve as manager in that company, they are still alive and here and I never heard about any of their machine that was looted, not even themselves that reported it to me to put it on somebody here to do it from one point to another. Now, you also mentioned that uh, you were a frontline supervisor. Um, when bombing fell to alert and was recaptured, you were active in the recapture of bombing? Yeah, very active. It was about that time that the Mahaya massacre occurred after the recapture of bombing. Were you anywhere around at the time the massacre took place? Or did you at any time meet with civilians in Tappenberg and told them that uh, they were being taken, that they should report to, to, um, to the parking station and board trucks to go to the displaced camp and that uh, your men divided sugar, farina, and all of that with them. Can you recall any of that? Well, man, when I stated my works about the Bopolo, or the bombing, and the Maha alleged massacre, I was very, very clear. I don't sound like somebody that guessing to say something. I believe by your time here now, you should know our investigation. I'm giving you so much witnesses or people that you can ask about my command structure in doing my time in bombing. I left from Lofa, I came and went Banga, took Banga, went instruct received an instruction to go to bombing. And the instruction was like something to me as a person. I felt that the president betrayed my trust because it was in no period of time that you would instruct me to go and take bombing and knowing that all the earth and rich in bombing that you announced to the world that gave Roland instruction to go and take bombing. It had the war in bombing very hard. It was not that in Banga two or three days we took bombing. We fought in bombing from the 6th of Judah to the 16th of Judah before we finally cash up bombing. And when we cash up bombing, Bishop Francis, the whole Cali thing that year, they can write, they can write even more than their commission. They used to visit that road nearly every day. And they, were, they came and visited me when they wanted to see the plan when I took bombing. Before I left bombing to go towards Bobolu front line. You can ask any of them. There was no point in time where we call up civilians and say, can't move to display camp. It was no point in time. When we took bombing, that same day, uh, I don't know what connection it looked like, but the legislative caucus of bombing were more than five member things. They were not two or three. And the only person that I know that I died was uh, uh, is uh, Soko Brown. That the only person that I know that I died, the rest of them stay alive. The party chairman of bombing, Mr. Adansin Data, is still alive. The superintendent of bombing, still alive. The old man that I selected as citizen here, civilian here, when I took bombing to talk on behalf of the citizen, all the journalists are in Liberia today, I believe most of them were here at that time. And they visited bombing and spoke to the old man several times. 
If somebody is saying Roland will acknowledge, Roland will inform, or Roland instruct them, I beg you make a follow up on it. Not because one person came here and say it to you people. It's very, very clear. If I have any involvement, it will not be one person. The people will say it there, and a lot of people will come here to tell you, including even Madame Sally herself, that know <clears throat> that her family from that area. So I uh, just want some more clarification. I understand that you say that uh, you did not take part, you had no involvement in what is known as the Maha massacre. You had no involvement in that. No. And you never heard that any such massacre occurred. Seriously. And uh, was any boy at the time about 12, 13, taken from Bombay at that time by you, brought to Monrovia and gave to a friend, and that boy ran away? No. Now, they but, no, I, I, you know, they, they know, they know may not even be sufficient. Uh, I believe people were here. Other people have videotaped. The Roland tool that are talking to you today was not the Roland tool that time when he go on a battlefront. I was not a kind of big man commander with forces behind him. Anytime we go on a mission, we have somebody that I directly supervise as commander. And for me to take a civilian, individual civilian, I don't know how many of them were really brave to just get in my car at that time with all, because all the good and that's all the casual city when I'm going there, I can go with it and I can try. But I can't remember where I associated with civilian can ride with me, let go this. Or other photo that I just saw civilian and put them in their car and took them somewhere and say, take care of their boy. And for one reason. Maybe I should give you a little more details yeah. to clarify your mind. Uh, this little boy survived the, 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 well, he was not taken to the Maher Bridge. But he was taken to a place somewhere along the road before you get to the Maher Bridge. And he, along others, were uh, attacked by uh, government forces at the time. They were beaten with sticks and stones and dumped into a hole. And this little boy succeeded in climbing out of the hole. And when he did, he started going back to bombing. And at Coma Hill, your commander, I've forgotten the name of the commander, but I can get a name later, took him, the commander was at Coma Hill, took him and gave him to a herbalist to take care because his bones were nearly all broken. And then you later on took the little boy, brought him to Monrovia, gave him to a friend, and then he subsequently ran away from this friend that he gave him to. Is this... Before any friend name that I gave him to that we can... <clears throat> well, that will, I can... I, I, I would need to go back and check our records. But the name is there. But as you say, you don't remember. Yeah, so you know, you know, you know, some of the things that were I stated in my statement, if the TRC process would not be where somebody just kind of say, fine story, maybe the monetary value for the kind of hardship in the country, somebody may say some of things. No, is this story, to, to the best of your knowledge, it, it, is this it, story it, it, true? It's just a mere story, that's what I'm trying to indicate, Commissioner. And it's a fabrication. Are, yeah, I want for you to understand that it's a mere story. Under no point in time that we took people from here, uh, took people from bombing because they were beaten or wounded or that and gave them to somebody to be treated. Personally, no. Even the common hill he talking about, people that travel the route after the cash of uh, bombing will tell you the base that we stay until we took bombing was Common Hill. Common Hill is like one or two car before the city of bombing. As now you bend Common Hill, there is one other deep car that when you climb, you see the lofty right under you. If you know the particular area they're talking about, it's not place that have do. any gate. If you saw a gate there, or people saw a gate there after the cash of bombing, when we took bombing, everybody moved into bombing from Common Hill. No, at Como Hill, there's a building there. Uh, upstairs building. Upstairs building. That where I was sleeping in before. There, the there was a gate there. 
There was a checkpoint there. After they catch up on me. Yeah, there was a checkpoint there. You sure? There was a checkpoint at the Mahe Bridge. There was a checkpoint at that particular spot. I remember spot. there was a checkpoint at Mahe Bridge. But a checkpoint was in Komon. Maybe it was temporary, but I can't really remember a checkpoint being stationed at Komon Hill. But I believe that was the base we was before taking bombing. And in, slept in that hostel building. You in, in the recapture of uh, bombing, was uh, Benjamin Yaten active in that area? Uh, I can say yes. Because at the time the war was closer to Morovia, Ben were in and out. Even when I took Banga before I left for Bome, the chief had sent Ben to Banga when I was leaving for Bome mission. And yes, yes, all the frontline Ben were visiting Ben, including Bome. Was uh, Zigzag Mazda also active in the area? Did he? Uh, was I he don't operational? Know, I don't know how active or what the active you're talking about, but. Was he, at the was, was he, he, no, was he, he at the bombing front line? You no, know, he was not a fighter on the front line directly. He was a son with Ben. Did uh, General Sheriff, Vamoyan Sheriff, did he visit the front line? He was stationed in bombing. He fought with me for the retaking of bombing. In fact, it was Vamoyan Sheriff that control area bombing. Did he uh, at any point rescue anybody who should have been killed at that bridge? And was the person was in the process or he was about to be killed when uh, he arrived on the scene, driving at night, early evening, maybe seven, eight o'clock, flash the light, and rescue somebody who was about to be killed at the bridge. Oh man, if Amoya did that when he come, you explain why and when he did it. Amoya is not a hardened person. I don't think he's somebody that would not be willing to speak to the commission because he one person that took upon himself to go far ahead to speak against Taylor. And now that his testimony is over, I see no reason why he will not come here. But I don't know much about that. Because if it was something that he did and he reported it to me, I would point to know. And at that time, I would fire now a senior officer to Vamoyan that he may not talk to because he was deputizing uh, Christopher Vamo at that time at the BT Chief of Staff. So if it was something that he wanted for me to know in his control area, he could tell me all because he was in charge and we went to help them. Maybe he decided not to tell me, but he didn't tell me nothing of such. Does the name Blue Town in Riverside ring a bell to you? Pardon? Blue Town, came on Blue Town in Riverside. Does that name ring a bell to you? No. Are you aware that a massacre took place in Kiman Blue Town? About 500 persons were killed in Kiman Blue Town by MPFL fighters? No. Under your command? If, under my command? Yes. No. Now, you mentioned also that you were a general uh, frontline supervisor and that you fought in the foyer area. Yeah. Did you, or do you know any town? In the foyer area, on the other side of the border, the town called Buedu. Yes. Were you ever active in that area? No. Did you ever operate with the RUF in that area? <laughs> no. Did RUF provide you support while you were in that area? No. And there was no RUF connection in that area? No. No. As, as our informed, Buedu was a bigger time across the border. In fact, uh, there used to be a market from where I base. Everybody in Foya, you ask them, they will tell you I base in Foya, Tenya for a very long time before I took Foya. And I, from, in fact, before taking Foya, I left Foya, Tenya and went to Yaksadu uh, before taking Foya, where we fought Saros down the Lord and myself against the Lord Saros down in Konon Begu and all that area there. They will tell you that I created an airstrip at Foya Tinja where uh, I base, and there was a fee there that 
we used to mostly interact from and the record is clear. Did you at any time ever uh, have any troops under your command that killed people in the Kulahun area and cut their heads off and kept it in a barrel in the town in, in uh, Bigfoot barrels or what do you call it, these 55 drums uh, barrels? You know the Kulahun thing continued to come from the various commissioners. We fought in Kulahun several times as I said. In fact, to the extent where the law themselves considered the play as their military base because most of their fighters were running away from the scene because of the strong force that were red side in, in Foya. And for civilian, if they were there, I don't think the law that fought in Kulahun will also talk for me. To be caught by other people, maybe that's something that happened that I don't know about. But during our period when we were fighting there, I don't see the amount of civilians that were really there and how many people were killed. Even if one or two persons say, hey, oh man, 1,000 human beings dying, I, I'm sure at this time the commission should have some good picture of the map, yeah, and all of that. It will not be one place, it will not be two. It will be area that people will be able to see, that we ourselves can see, but the number of 1,000, the amount of people dying and being caught and put into very PV barrel and all of that, if that's something that to my knowledge, I will say no. Well, I can just say that uh, in our work, we have been able to uh, identify more than uh, 70 mass graves in, 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 uh, in Lofa. A number of them around the Kolahun area. Now, but was there any time, are you familiar with the uh, Operation, Operation uh, No Baby on Target in the Masabolahun area? Did you operate in Masabolahun? Did you ever enter Masabolahun? No, I didn't reach Masabolahun. You never entered there? The forces I was living in was to come towards Masabula and you seen that route to meet the forces I was living uh, four years away to go towards Kulahun. Uh, when I left Vahun for four years, uh, General Yeten was the person left in charge of that area and he, the forces I left and they're going straight to war, Nyanehu, Masa, Bolahu, you see that route to connect her ox to Kulahu or connect the forces that I carried before her was led by General Yete. Did you at any time prior to the war live in Gardnersville? Pardon? Did you at any time prior to the war 1990, did you at any time live in Gardnersville? Gardnersville? Yes. Before 1990? Yeah, before no. the outbreak of the war. Did you no. at any time live there? No. Never did. Now, did you at any time in Borowie town, uh, did you at any time attempt to have sex with a pregnant woman who refused and her husband was later killed on your orders? Pardon? Did you at any time in Borowie town, you know Borowie town? I know very well. Did you at any time attempt to have sex with a pregnant woman who refused and you had a husband killed? Other her to be killed? Other her husband to be killed? No. Today, up to today, in fact, around Liberia, the only place I ever gave me land for farming is, is around Bolo Guetan. Bolita gave me 50 acres of land. Up to today, we speak for farming. And the citizen there, we say that I don't know who the husband and what his name and all of that. And I don't know. In fact, uh, my my my. My, I don't know, I should say, my stepmom, my daddy, for his wife, that her home area there. And the people there accepted me. I lived at base in Bodo Guetan during the LPC war for a very long time. If I kill somebody, husband, the woman said, will come here if I attempt to rape her. I don't think it will be something in healing, but I will say no. No, the killing is reported to have occurred in uh, uh, Plo, you know Plo, in River Yeah. yeah. You, you, did you at any time take anybody there and had that person executed? No. Now, during your service with the MPFL, did you any time interact with uh, Sam Bokari, otherwise known as uh, Mosquita? No. With the MPFL? 
Sam Bokari was an RUF fighter. Mm -hmm. Did you at any time interact with him in Sierra Leone, in Liberia? You did not? No. The only time I saw Sam Bokari when he was seeking refuge in Morovia, I spent my year resident. He was staying at Benjamin Yetin's residence. I don't residence. know where he was staying, but I left the front of his No, I mean, did I hear you say he was staying at... No, I say I met him at Benjamin Yetin's residence. Oh, you met him at Benjamin Yetin's residence? When he was seeking refuge in Liberia. But would you know anything about the circumstances surrounding his death? No. I have no idea? No. You have any when idea of any... that I was fighting, I think the first or second war in Morovia was going on. And enemy had taken counter, and that was on that side. That was very far from me. But I think former President Black came here, and I think he talked on it because at that time he was in the Nima region. Did you have? Did you at any time have under your command one Darius Kekula, otherwise known as Equalizer? That. Dara Kekula? Yes. No. Otherwise known as Equalizer. No, the only Equalizer that I know is General Fasu. General? Fasu. Rufus Fasu. He been invited by this one. Yeah. He was. Now, you said that at the time of the killing of Sam Bokari, you were fighting somewhere else. Yeah. But would you have any idea of any of those Liberians from the MPFL or from the government forces at the time that fought alongside Sam Bokari or who may have been around during the killing of Sam Bokari? No. Do you have any idea about the killing of uh, Isaac V and uh, John Yomi? No. Do you know anybody who was involved, any of the men who were involved in his killing? No. While serving as frontline supervisor, did you at any time have child soldiers under your command? No. All the people that were with us on the front line, as I said earlier, a little bit I'm repeating myself now. Uh, I think you all have very videotape about the war, the journalist came when I told bombing, they were videotaped, they were published, same thing happened in Kulahu and yeah. all of that. They will have some child soldiers and you will point them out and maybe they will tell all their year and all that thing. But at that point in time, I will not ask you how many year old, how many year old you are and before you go on the front line. When uh, the government forces retook Bopolo during 2002, mm -hmm. there was a visit, an assessment visit by the international relief community there. You, you were the commander there at the time. In Bobolo? Yes. When we talk Bobolo, no NGO, no international community visitor or there until I left. Nobody was able to even take that room until I left. After government forces took Bobolo? Mm -hmm. Nobody, no, no, post, no international organization visited that room until I left. We had generally that, they, that came and they visited the area and all of that. But for us, we, CMG. There, there was a team there from the UN and other agencies no, that no. visited Bopolu and met you on the ground in Bopolu and reported that there were child soldiers there no, alone. I, I can't remember that particular. You do not remember? This is 2002. Yeah, 2002 I took Bopolu. The same time I took Bome, after I took Bome, I went towards Bopolu. In my deliberation, I said that when I took Bome, I went towards Bopolu and we took Bopolu. And when we talk Bobolo, even the, 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 the citizens that surrounded, the soldiers, the law forces that surrounded to us, there was nobody to come in Bobolo to receive them. There were people that we brought in Morovia. Chief Jalalun here, yeah, he's still living. The Red Cross were here, and they turned those people over to their family in Morovia here. Yeah. They didn't come in Bobolo for them, no. Now, as frontline supervisor, active in that area, in the bombing area, what would you know of air raids conducted by government aircraft choppers on our Bobolu town and surrounding areas? I don't know. Except if it was done before my arrival, all our war in bombing, we never fought with helicopter. 
Nobody from law will come here and say Roland do and impose his fuck with helicopter. No. Are you not aware that uh, helicopters was used by the government forces in the offensive against Lurk? It was, I, I don't know if that was done in, bomb, uh, in bombing. To be specific, Bopolo. I don't know. I can remember there was an air race on Zozo when the war started. No. Air raid by? The government forces. Using what kind of aircraft? They have a helicopter. They have a helicopter gunship. And a gunship was used in a raid against Zozo. Yeah. Zozo. But now you don't remember or you don't know if they... They saw what done in Bobolo, no. But as a frontline supervisor, were you such information did not come to your attention? I don't know, maybe a lot of time not frontline supervisor. I don't know the particular point in time which you you ask him, but if it's around two thousand two I would say that it never happened. Now I'm talking about fighting and being in the southeast and being stationed in the southeast and being in control of the MBFL uh, or government forces uh, in the southeast. What would you know about the involvement of government forces? Uh, in an attack on the Ivory Coast? At that time, I was not in the southeastern region, and I don't know if there was an attack through the southeastern region on onto Ivory Coast. And if that was done, that's something that I don't know about. I, even I never heard about that. I don't know if the power ground Chile or whatsoever to go. But uh, would you consider it strange or unusual that for somebody who holding the kind of rank you were holding that these kinds of operations like the air raid on Bopolo, the attack on the Ivory Coast and all of that, the excursions into Sierra Leone and all of that, that you absolutely be in no knowledge of? Would you consider it usual or unusual or unusual? It depends on the point and time we are speaking. The war in Liberia lasted for so long and my leadership within the organization was just almost late days. I can say it because when you hear that I have the UN disarmament all of that when Taylor left and the forces that were in arm from the former GO especially the Malaysia group, Malaysia group were believed to be somebody without control and since I was here with the housing event, the defense minister seemed to be somebody working for the transition government at that time. I volunteered myself to help with the disarmament. That was the land I was speaking from. But if there was something during that period, then it was unusual. But one thing that I know about the institution that we work with, which was the former GOL, uh, most of the world was directed by President Taylor himself. And he sometimes tells you what you need to know. And he sometimes sends you where he wants you to go. So from what you're saying, we can safely conclude that the president at the time was in direct command and control of the fighting forces. Oh, yes. And so can we also, by that, assume that those massacres that were carried out by government forces were carried out under his instructions or, or that he approved of them? I have not, not gone to that extent. I don't want to indict my former leader. I don't know how many massacres he knew about, he don't know about. The day he appeared to the TRC, he will be able to tell you that. But one thing that I know very clearly, President Taylor gave instruction to you depending on the way you work and sometimes what he want you to do. But on the front line, for somebody to say I was instructed by President Taylor to carry on a massacre, I'm not talking for him. I'm, I'm not saying yes. And I cannot easily say no, but one thing I know is some or even a very frontline commander who we were very aware that if you take a war prisoner and carry him to Taylor, that means that particular war prisoner, you don't want him to be killed. If you're not even lucky, he will start riding car that the frontline commander had never ride before. He will start wearing some jeans suit that you had never wore before. So people were skeptical taking people to tell her and say, oh, uh, this is the person that catch her and all of that. But if it's instruction or massacre, I don't know to which extent or what he intend to win it, it's something that I cannot answer from there because uh, the front line was buried. 
Talking about war prisoners, how many war prisoners did you take? Did the forces under your command take throughout? And yeah, what happened to them? Yeah, they ain't got me when I said we brought almost 100 into the town and what they No, but you just said that uh, if you were a commander, you know that if you took a war prisoner it, to it Taylor, is. then you know that you don't want that prisoner to die. I'm so that. for the rest of those who were not, who were caught but not taken to Taylor, what happened to them? I'm, say, I'm saying that to, uh, to, 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 to Taylor, it happened to myself. If there is serious war on the front line where somebody is captured, people believe that that person reached me, we live. And I've said an example here. When somebody says the people that are talking about all of them are that, then it sounds like somebody trying to lie. I, I show an example of one uh, Famata, a uh, mayor general, two star general that are captured from law in an uh, ambush that reached me. If she can come here and say, when we were cash out, we were five or six and reach Roland and one that, at least we have some level of proof. But now, I'm saying this very clearly. You mentioned earlier that uh, the Catholic Archbishop Francis, the Catholic uh, um, or team or priests or whatever in, uh, in Bomi, you mentioned other prominent residents of Bomi, that none of them, the police commander, I think you mentioned the police commander, you mentioned that none of these people had ever, excuse me, had ever reported that a massacre occurred at the Maher Bridge. That's a very serious point. Now, but are you aware that these people who you mentioned, that they took part in ceremonies marking the commemoration of the Maher massacre, are you aware that they all took part in such ceremonies <laughs> to commemorate the massacre? That people died there. Yes, to commemorate. The massacre that last year, so and so time, a massacre occurred and so many people got killed. Why did people go in there? A particular ceremony program was held to commemorate the massacre. And this little same boy that I mentioned to you, that who had been given up for dead, and on the day of that feast, when they had the feast, to commemorate the victims that he showed up. Are you aware that all of the, all of these things happen? I know that several programs have been going on for people that die at the Maha Bridge. And but if there is a special occasion on this day that I don't really know except you tell me which day you're talking about. But I believe that most of them, uh, most of the people are indicating to they are from Bombay. And if they went there, that is very far. But going there is another thing, and they, they say Roland was involved in the killing that took place. That one really I want to know myself. And if they really know and Lula to it, were, were they informed at that time that it happened? Or if they were informed, were they people that were able to tell Roland all oh, this happened? Or just to pass by here, something, just something, not to say we hold you responsible or so, but our people died. So, from what I understand from you, it is possible that this massacre occurred, but you don't know about it, you never heard about it. Or, to the best of your knowledge, this massacre did not occur at all. From, from my statement, previous statement, I said it. I said, what looked true in the whole thing is killing took place at Maha Bridge. How many people were involved? Who did the killing? Who were involved? That's something up to today that I don't know. But if it's class a massacre, where well, more than 10, 15, 20, 100 human beings died, I don't also know. Now, how would you describe the command and control structure of the MPFL or the GOL, starting from the top at that time? up to 2003? Uh, the MPFA, I may not know much about because when I became a chief of staff in MPFL, but during the period that I started taking leadership in MPFL, the leadership was excellent and the command structure was fine. I didn't see a problem at that time uh, so, when I took over a chief of staff. So Mr. Taylor was uh, commander in chief? Yeah. Who was, who was his deputy from whom others, looking at the, the echelon of control, 
during the, the MPFL day when I began a chief of staff, the vice president, at that time we used to call him vice president too, because I was something like an MPRA AG government on that side. And the person was the lead in Dogolie. But beside that, on the military front, when I began a chief of staff, the immediate boss at that time, who was the chairman of John Chief of Staff, was John Tier. And so, so you reported to John Tier. Pardon? So, in the structure, you were reporting to John Tier. That was the chairman of John Chief of Staff. But in some point in time, the commander in chief who called the very divisional chief of staff to give them direct mandate, direct instruction, and have meeting with them. But nearly all our meetings with the president, the chairman of John Chief March. What would you know about the group that operated? known as the bandits. Bandit? Yeah. No. To operate within MPFL control area? Yes, as the bandit. And bandits. they call themselves bandit? Yes. Hmm. I, I don't know. You have no idea? No. What can you tell us about Wild Geese? Wild Geese was a tolerate unit assigned with President Tita. Who was the direct commander? The direct commander of Wild Geese, as I know, was Chipley, Matthew Chipley. Chief who? Matthew Chipley. Matthew Chipley? Yeah. Is he still alive? Yeah. Is he here in Liberia? Yeah, in Morocco. How about uh, the, the group that was headed by... Um, the Marines. What can you tell us about the Marines? During the MPF time, uh, the Marines existed long before I even began a chief of staff. Controlled by Nathan K from Nathan K, I think to Melvin Sobani and all of that. There was a division just like the Navy was. What do you know about, if you have any idea, about the practice of cannibalism in the MPF? People eating people parts, him or hearts and all of that. What would you know about that? About the leadership taking part? Did Mr. Taylor take part? Did you yourself take part? It's not true. I, I can't remember. Even up to today, I hear myself speaking. I don't even take in anything I look like liquor. I can't smoke cigarettes. So I don't know where I will go eating human being. And I don't believe at any time where I take part. And President Taylor, I don't know, maybe the tether I know is not even a tether that we're talking about at the commission. To be brave and say you're a human being, rather when you go kill the people, rather when you go fire them. And really, I don't really receive that level of instruction from Taylor before. And being a frontline commander, if I did, uh, frontline supervisor, if I did it, I don't know how many of that. But one thing I know about Taylor, if you sit with him and be able to talk to him and convince him, and he take into you and believe you, I don't mind you. 12 year old, you 3 year old, you 100 year old. They don't never have time of your age or whatsoever, but he was always concerned about what you're capable of doing. That's the thing that I know. And he was very clear about that. When he gave you responsibility, take it serious. But for Taylor to say in any point in time, he tell Rodan to kill 100 persons in bombing, to kill 200 persons somewhere, if it's true that it's funny that Roland did that, I don't think it's by Taylor instruction. No way. So because who? the tell that I know, he never told me anything, even in CPC and say, Roland, the thing we're talking here, the way Lola did, I think it's better we do it, the way that kill all the people. Hey, so, we're sitting here today, we're sitting here talking about it. He never told me that. Is it possible that he didn't, he, as you say, he never gave you any such instructions or any such orders? But is it possible that he may have given such instructions to others? Why would I say I will not wait every day, I will not wait every night? Maybe it happened. Uh, for me, I say why well, I know. So, who, who do you think uh, may have ordered the execution of uh, Sam Doki and his uh, his uh, family? The death of Sam Doki, for me, as a Nibalian, is one of the things that we really fear. And I don't know by which instruction, but I know that investigation was conducted. People may say that the investigation was not uh, uh, given a uh, a fair trial, uh, or maybe the people involved didn't really face a fair trial. So at the end of the day, people were not inv uh, people was not arrested, and so. But it's one situation that I regretted. 
and what we heard at that time is most of the people especially i think two or three boys that were already involved in it flew the country and all of that but if that was tailored i told them now the country is free maybe they will come and they will be able to say it but for me to sit down here and say it if he has said it to me i could say maybe taylor say it or maybe the person say it but that's something that he had never given such an instruction before but the records show that after mr Duki was arrested he was taken to the police station in Banga and the police commander at the time uh, Ernest B lieutenant colonel I think his rank was major either major or lieutenant colonel was in charge and Mr. Yeten ordered him to turn over the living body of Mr. Doki to him and subsequently after that turning over Mr. Doki Chart remains along with that of his wife and bodyguard and family member were found. Do you think that Mr. Yitem may have acted on his own or he was issued instructions? I don't know if Ben did that from the Drogi investigation. But you do know that uh, he took if, you if know he that was, he took if, him from the police if, station. If he was the one that took Drogi from the police station but then I don't know how the investigation could have set him free from A. That's something that I don't know because I was not much concentrated uh, around the Morovia and the Banga in command at that time. But as but a Nibayan, one, thing, uh, I, one thing that I said clearly was Taylor trusted a lot of people including myself. I came from nowhere. I'm not a special forces. My relatives were not a special forces. I never got close to Taylor from any relationship or intermarry or anything. Uh, but when I started working hard on the battlefront, he trusted me with a lot of leadership and with a lot of responsibility. That one thing I know. And if he trusts people, he was one person, I think that was one of his weaknesses. That when he trusts you, he trusts that person. Maybe on that line, other people may misbehave knowing that he trusts them. Uh, the situation is just like that. Maybe that was weakness to say, but it's just like that with other leaders. Because in recent days, I decided to evolve myself from air publication and all of that. But people have been saying that uh, Madame Seri, that they know before as the Iron Lady or Library, that I only see Madame Seri today. Because the people she put around them, they are so close to her that she can't prosecute them. Maybe that's what was happening to Taylor too. Now, what would you know about the execution of uh, disabled soldiers by Governor of Liberia troops in the area that was controlled by you, supervised by you? Disabled soldiers? Yes. Were killed? Yes. Where? in the combat camp area Pardon? remember remember if you can recall very well that mr taylor said in a radio announcement on the radio sometime during that period that he was going to pay his soldiers in combat camp and this was right after the large forces had come to freeport and pulled back and then there was an announcement on the radio that he was going to pay his forces in a combat camp. You are aware of that. I'm sure you may have heard that announcement or you must have heard that announcement. Mm -hmm. Then what happened? I played the, 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 the disabled were killed. That's why they went for the pay and never came back. You think that's true? Well, I'm asking you. Uh -huh. Is there any truth in that? If it happened, I don't know. And up to the disarmament, period even up to today as a commissioner uh, as a disarmament commission we have the disabled represented by one Ewe Meyer personally uh, at the commission I think he left the commission with the ambity team and he he was somebody that was in leadership also at that time even up to the time you and myself speaking he had never lectured me or such and he's somebody that he and myself very, very close. Uh, if there's something that happened around come back here and they went there to take pay, uh, <laughs> they say we went there to take pay, why, 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 I don't know ever. 
Mm, I don't know how they will vote their PSA on front line. Well, I mean, there was an announcement that came from the president himself at the time. Huh? You read the announcement. I, I can't say I read it here because I don't know the period. I was in between here, Lofa, Banga, Salaye, front line, and other areas. I was not ready. It's in Morovia. Now, you mentioned also that uh, you were in uh, Basa and you did some work with the OTC. Now, it's common knowledge that OTC had a private militia that security guards were carrying AK-47s and other automatic weapons. Were you the one supplying them with those weapons? <laughs> All the security that were in OTC, there were various security within the command of OTC. OTC have their own security that they organize, which are organizing and supervising. them. There were other security assigned to some senior people there uh, that were considered a VIP uh, in the area where, in fact, the community were considered a VIP. Uh, President Taylor have a resident right to the camp, to the OTC area. They were also in arm. And there were some forces that were recruited, some men that were recruited by name as security officer within the OTC that already knew about arm. And so you armed them? No, they were not officially armed. But some of them was group that had some level of association with uh, militia forces and all of that, and they received arm. And some that were even assigned with myself that used to go with me to OTC control area were also armed. On whose orders, whose instructions, who supplied the arms? You did or you got it from OTC or? It the, the various units that were there, the one that I control, especially the guys from my own unit and all of that, was arm that I gave to them. So is it correct to say that uh, you were the commander of the OTC militia forces? I never knew OTC had militia. That's why you hear me laugh, uh, you see me laughing at you. Because when you say OTC get militia, I don't know where they are militia operated. And I don't know. I don't know. I never knew about OTC militia. Now, you mentioned also about the Buchanan Front area. What was the excitement of General Kuku Dennis in that area? When I met Kuku Dennis, as I said in my deliberation, Kuku Dennis also became the chief of staff of Navy. Kuku became the chief of staff of Navy. But when I met Kuku Dennis in the, the Natitiri War, late 93 in the Bikana area around the Lac area. He was commanding the unit from Lac coming towards Bikana, trying to stop the forces of ECOMO and AFL and other units that were helping them from advancing towards Lac. That I know about General Kugu. Earlier day, in fact, that was my first time seeing him after the fall of Bikana. And on the other side, going to Riverside, it were uh, General Paul Kofi Za and the late General Jinji Oble were heading a commander. And later, Kuku became the chief of staff of Navy before me. Yeah, still in that, uh, still in that area, what would you know about the MPFL use of landmines? Uh, I believe that. It's not something that I really, really know about, but there was land mine that was used. I believe it, uh, I don't know who was in control of that area, but Ekoma was using MOA, Ekoma was using uh, MOBA for their advancement and other things, and the forces that were fighting on that road was using land mine to stop the the ECOMO forces from advancing. So MBFL did use the landmines yes, yes. in that area? Yes. You have an idea what was the source of those landmines and to what extent were landmines used to the rest of the uh, country? No, I think that the only place that I ever first know about landmines and if it was used in other areas, I don't know. And I didn't hear about it throughout my MBFL day. Now, talk about the uh, you mentioned about the, the structure of the of the uh, of the military. 
You mentioned the name of General Kona, Bengba Y. Kona. How much power and authority did he actually exert as Chief of Staff, Armed Forces of Liberia? Uh, I don't know. I said you asked General Kona. But if you ask what ruler, what power. Did you take any orders from him, for example? If he gave General me and special orders. If he gave me an order, I would take it. He was Did my you boss. take any order? I'm not saying whether if, if he gave you orders, you would take it or not. At the time, did he issue any general and special orders that passed down to him or that he passed down to you through whatever echelon? Yes. Was he directing the, uh, the activities of the military? He was a chairman of John Chief. He may not have been seen the front line for an age or so, but he was a chairman of John Chief. So, but you earlier said... Hassad Ono is, 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 is a school of vision where he held some, he held some meeting and he was a, a, a person that held a meeting and that was a meeting also with, with, with the military and the president which he was part but of. But if, if you, 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 both of you were of the same rank, right? Father? Both of you were of the same rank or you had a higher rank? He was higher than me. Your rank was three Lieutenant star. General. Yeah. But Lieutenant General uh, in the military is also three stars. My rank was Lieutenant General. When I was going to work four stars when he became the General of John Chief. Even a lot of Benma, you tell others that carry him to work four stars, he appointed Benma a deputy to bring my work on a deputy. And Benjamin, you tell us five stars. Four. Four stars. So who was higher in the command and control structure? Who was higher? Was but it Benjamin Yeten, you or General Kona? Kona was higher than me. Benjamin Yeten was also higher than me. In terms of reporting, the battalion commanders through the brigade commanders, did they report to General Kona or they, they reported to somebody else? They reported to the various chief of staff. To the various chief of staff? Yeah, that they work on. And who was the chief of staff supremo? Was it General Kona? Or Benjamin Yeten? The superior for the chief of staff? Yeah. And change your command, I would say, was Benjamin Yeten. So, in other words, General Yeten, Debeta, Kona. So, in other words, uh, General Kona had no real authority. He had authority. Why would you say that? <laughs> Why would you say that? Kona was respected as chairman of John Chief. He may not really be the one moving all around the show himself. Like, even for myself, when I was on the front, I said, somebody tell you there is a rolling duo. The name was so big and people hear the name. I think today you are saying you're disappointed. You are thinking about five persons like you. But no, no, it's, it's one time. No, 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 like I'm, not, I'm not disappointed. Yeah, so uh, so somebody said this, ready to roll into it. I know everybody ready to go on to be there. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not disappointed because I, 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 you mentioned, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, 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 our, our delegation visited Bobolu after the recapture of Bobolu, our humanitarian assessment team. I was on that team, that's why I saw you for the first time. So I'm not surprised that. And you came on our NGO? I was working with the United Nations. At that time? Yes, and sir. And you came at UN delegate? Yes, sir. And met me at UN delegate? You were there in Bobolu. And you met me at UN delegate? I was part of the team. And you said that you were from UN, you met me? Yes, sir. Che. The records are there. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was, the records are there. No. No, it's not true. I don't want to say, Mr. Commissioner, you are lying. Well, you went delegation <laughs> hunting. Serious people visited Bobolu. Seriously, when I talk Bobolu, serious people visited Bobolu. But to be from the United Nations or a special international organization like WFP or some international organization that to say that they came as a team and met me in Bobolu, hey, oh man, I will say no. It was a combined team. And one of the one of the, the, the soldiers under your command that was there, who I knew personally, was there. He is the son of Councillor Sekajipo Wallo. If you know the name Councillor Sekajipo Wallo, his son was there under your command. I asked him, what are you doing here Not in, in school? And he was still a child then. Anyway. Let's move on. That's something that I can't remember. I can't remember where I ever go on front line. A team or such. How delegate team visit me. I can't remember. But anyway, 
That's why you say for your opinion, I will say that, but I can't really remember where I hosted a UN team in that area when I took Boko to know. Several what? other areas they came and people visited me, even in Bombay and other things. What would you know about, if you have any, any idea about the death of Francois Massacre? Francois Massacre, I only heard when uh, the helicopter he was using was ambushed. Uh, at that time, people told him that Pajama was casual and he was going there with medicine and all that thing, and they fired him. Uh, at that time, law had taken the front chairman, but we're not on the front now already. The dog had taken who's the dog? Lord. Oh, Lord. 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 Oh, oh, okay, okay. But that time we're in Morovia. So you had no idea? Yeah, my Francois died we in Morovia. Did you at any time operate with uh, Christopher Vambo, otherwise known as Mosquito, in the river says area? No. When uh, I was sent a unit commander to control the, the river cell phone line, I changed Christopher Vamo from the leadership. At that time, there was some trouble within the Bodo Vietnam Moet area between the fighter that were under Christopher Vamo and the citizen, which, of course, I went with the investigation team that went there to investigate the incident. And later the team was transferred to lab to continue the investigation. And I was asked to take care of the people that are there. That's why when you say in Bodo Vietnam, I decided to lay down with one people there. And I, she said no, so I said the monkey or Hosmo and all of that. I hope that people can come today and will be able to tell me not only that, Bolo Vietan is my ma home and step ma home. Uh, they stand that personally live. And I have uh, some of my children from there, from that particular time. And I live in Bolo Vietan too. And we have a very good relationship. I don't see where I decide to, to even rape or lay down with somebody by force. And at that time, if anybody that wrote into one, I can't remember how many women ever say no to me. Of course, I'm not going to lay one. Day, so. Now, um, you also mentioned that you are in control of the Sino River Stairs area, as you mentioned earlier. Did Mr. Oscar Cooper exercise any command authority in Sino over militia fighters? In Sino? Yes. No. He did not. Did he have any I don't know if the the unit that was assigned in Sano uh, around that day, because Oscar operation really with the logging when he took over from Mori, it was during the the time the war had ended in Sano, and even with my own contract with him and all of that, and the higher business in Sano was conducted by him. In, in the under the tailor led government, and he was in the higher business because, like, the port and all of that was you, something that he saw these from. He was controlling the port, yes. He, he, he was, he was, he, he saw these from the National Port Authority, and they, they, they were in business. So, so he was subleased from the National Port Authority, Father? they were subleased, yes, yes, from I, the National Port Authority, yeah, yeah. to him, yes. So he was a businessman there, and I believe with him that if he has some control, because if you are the bigger businessman, if, if other people, like if Roland Duo go today in Nima and he's a big businessman there, you work with police or you work with NSA or whatsoever you need, you work with. If you want gas, you want other things, I will give it to you. But to say you go and do your job and other things, like you were in command structure or in authority at director of police or deputy or have that authority at director of police, that's something that I don't know. So there were no fighters that signed with him? No, I can't say that. Except if the security that, that was there. So of course, on the security that work in the port, for people that won fought war and all of that, but to say that there were soldiers 
within the former GOL or they were militia forces within the former GOL as well to be in Lofa and they were there fighting. Maybe he did it, but that's something that it was not to my knowledge, it was not official. Are you aware of any massacre that uh, is said to have taken place around the put area in that time in which he was an active participant? I will not know if even it happened, but to say I hear about it, no. Now, during Operation Octopus, where were you? Operation Octopus. I took part in Operation Octopus. Which sector of the front line you took part? We came with the Navy group on the main road. Uh, they used to call the area D farm, uh, D ground, I mean, sorry, D ground, uh, right after the the uh, excuse me, how the the at that on the bright family there. There is a farm right after my Bagley on the left extreme. Right after that farm, there was a hill there. They got the ground. The forces that were using the main road, I was with them. But I didn't steal too long on the front when all the navy were requested to go back to the Canada. What was your rank at the time? No, I was not really a ranking officer. You were just a foot soldier in a battalion. Which company are you in? Alpha, Navy, Bravo? I came with the Navy unit that came from Barcelona. I see. So you would not have any idea who were the top commanders at the time? No. But the Navy at that time were commanded by Johnson. Lema Chief of Staff, the late Lema. You said the late Johnson Lema? Yeah, was a Navy Chief of Staff. Now, when elections were held in 1997, and prior to that, the leader of the MPFL came to Monrovia amidst much fanfare and all of that. <laughs> if you. <laughs> If you came to Monero at that time, you would have seen the crowds and crowds and crowds of people. <laughs> Thank God I didn't come to call you your much man. Now, but at Mr. Taylor's house in Conga Town, after he moved from Mama Point, he moved to Conga Town. And according to Mr. Zigzag Mazda, somebody with whom you served, Oh. Ziza Maza, you mentioned that you serve, uh, serve in the same unit or in the same operational area. Ziza Maza was not near my right hand side. Ziza Maza was a bodyguard of Benma Yeten. Ziza Maza was a bodyguard of Benma Yeten. He was not somebody at my right hand side before I served him, though. No? Yeah, but he fought along the same bombing, trying to take bombing and all I that. I think he came with Ben, but he was not really a fighter on the front. And all my fighting around like Remy and Zizah Mazda never go on any front line. I don't know where he ever fought in a war. Maybe the day he can't even explain. But all before I took over. But I never, I never carried Zizah Mazda as commander on the front. So you know that me and Zizah Mazda really interacted like on the front line that I can really remember was a town the ambush, uh, the forces. The law forces ambushed Bema Yeten boys when he himself was ambushed and he survived from it around the same combat camp area that you're talking about. Uh, the car that I was in was the only car that never really fell the weight of the law forces and was not taken. But all the rest of the five cars that were in that convoy were all things that either got brown or were taken by law. And when we were coming, I was leaving bombing from land coming I met up with Yeten to clear and Ziza Maza rode with me. So when we met, we got in that ambush, I was fully aware that if I try to ask here or run away, I was going to die. So everybody that was with me in the car, we stopped the car and we decided to challenge the enemy. When they found out that there was return of fire, they stopped firing. So we managed to take my own car out of the hill. We did that. That's the only time me and Ziza Mazar really interacted on the battlefront. That was the only time? Yes. But 
I'm talking about an incident in Monrovia in which he participated by his own admission in the burial alive of a pregnant woman in the yard of Mr. Taylor and a sheep was sacrificed on top of where this woman was buried. That's why I continue to say we'll be going back to the same thing. If Caesar Mazar said that, that he was part of it, I don't know if he also said Roland Duo was there to witness it. No, I'm, I'm Which, just asking, yeah. were you a part of it? No. All right. Which I don't even believe that what Caesar Mazar is saying is true because plenty of people can hear me talking a lot of things. Maybe tell he want to kill and do that. Okay, I agree that he want to kill to do that, to sacrifice be better. But if even at my level, one instant, tell her now say bring white chicken, then sacrifice it, or bring a goat, or bring a cow. I would be brave to say yes, tell her he want to sacrifice a human being. But it's something that I, I was never instructed, that I never see. Even with all Taylor administration, one thing I know good is Taylor can talk. If you don't want for him to convince you, don't go near him. Someday when people die, when, when some of my friends die, they said the one the commissioner can feel bad. When I go, I don't even want to go back on the front. Roland, you know we brought the things from this. You know we got to try. If we leave it now, if we did they, the one or two person that die, all that. And we talk to you just a human being, and you consider going back. Nothing that I did then I was forced. Nothing. So if this happens, I then daily along with Taylor, maybe they did it. But I know something that you want to see and say, yes, because they know certain time we sacrifice chicken or certain time we sacrifice goat, so maybe we want to be able to sacrifice human being my house. No. Did you take part in the recapture of Banga 1994? No, no. You did not. I thought I was in the southeast. Oh, you were in the southeast at the time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So I just want to thank you very much for coming and spending the entire day with us and again for giving us your experience, sharing with us your perspectives on how the country can move forward and you spoke extensively on the reconciliation process and you recognize that mercy and justice are two very important components of reconciliation and you think this commission the people of Liberia should pursue that friend. I was just wondering whether you consider also that truth telling and admission of wrongs is um, or could be a component of this process that as, we are pursuing. As, as, I said that. Oh. I said that, yes. I said that truth must be heard and People should be willing to come and talk the truth. It, will, it shouldn't be a place where people will come and lie on each other. And people that are hearing the truth should be willing that way. I talk about sufficient sensitization because people are not coming to the TRC. Some people decide. In fact, when I was ready to come to the TRC, yesterday, it was like yesterday, uh, there were certain newspapers that were coming today. My daughter called me from a campus and said, Daddy, I saw some terrible thing here for you. They say you raped, they say you this day, and you sort of go to the court and all of that. And I went home last night trying to explain to her the process which we all agree that we will support in this country. So it's not like what you see in the newspaper. It's all allegation that she will be able to hear me. I know she's listening to me now as I speak. So at least she can be clear in mind. If even her friend is saying that on campus, they will be able to say. So there should be sufficient sensitization. The sensitization thing should work. I was coming here, people were thinking that, oh, but then the way you're going, Monte Town, he talked well. But I already work on my own mind. That indeed, I don't mind what who thought here today, I will not get best. Nothing will make me angry here today. I came purposely for that. So nothing will make me vex. So there should be sufficient sensitization where other people will be able to come and also talk. That way I started encouraging, that way I started encouraging, I mean, other people to come when you listen uh, to me saying what I said. But truth is to be here, it matter how much the truth be here. And I came here quite closely to say that if there is anything that I know about, the way I say things, I think if you even doubt me before, you will not continue dying me. Because there are a lot of people that are showing evidence and witnesses, they hear. There are not people that are not die. I don't say they could have died yesterday. 
the year. If you want to really find out the truth, not because somebody said this a corona, you write it down. Go and go find out. You will be able to find out. Even the citizen of Kulahu, there was some chief in Kulahu that we took from Kulahu. That even when the war finished, they came me and thanked me in time here. You can ask people there if they say Rona personal they went and decide to install it, put your key, they put your key, they put it will be clear, you will hear it. I don't want it be like something that somebody trying to have behind anything. That why I also say in the process that they should be able to there is anything where somebody thinks that I personally committed a crime. They can take me anywhere beside the process. I don't believe the best way to go about things is to sweep it under the carpet or under the table. So the truth got to be heard. The people that are hearing the truth should be willing to have mercy on the people that are hearing the truth. And at least there should be some level of justice. Not tomorrow, these people will go say, Roland say, they will bring war crime code in Liberia. I'm saying that the particular process is go with the authority to know who they supposed to prosecute. And they should recommend that. Just in case, maybe, because I can't put, you can't kill me for a death penalty that I stay in Liberia law, or you can't put me live in prison. Man. Even at two years, three years, there should be some punishment served. Where it will serve as deterrent for those who be criminal, that we shouldn't leave it empty. That's why I'm saying to the commission, I know that. And if we do all of these things, I recommend that, I believe we have a peace. We will be living, we will pave a way for peace in this country. I say that. Thank you again. Uh, just for emphasis, I'd like to stress that the Commission has its own standards. Uh, we don't just listen to one person and then we take it as uh, information before the Commission. All the questions Commissioners ask is based upon what we have gathered. And that's not one witness or two witness from all of the counties Sino, Grand Bassa, Riverside, Lofa, Bomi County, Bapulu, Bon County, information was collected. And together we're talking about more than 100 witnesses from all the counties. And that's the why we felt it was very, very necessary for you to come. And 100 witnesses, 38 counts of allegations. You know, um, that is why we're convinced it's necessary for you to come and address yourself to all of these. But we are satisfied that you have come and you provided yourself the story. And that is the purpose of the commission. Uh, we have to be very, very fair and make sure that everybody has the opportunity. That's why we go out of the way to make sure. So thank you very much. We again take stock of your testimony and the recommendations you've made. Now that your testimony has come to an end, before you leave, is there anything you'd like to say briefly? There will be nothing strange than what I've said in my deliberation. Uh, I hope that the Commission should work over time to inform the people. Don't feel that nobody wants to come to the Commission, but some of the allegations are strong. And I would not be surprised that I leave from here people saying newspaper that I came to defend what was said against me, but it was not my purpose of coming here. I came purposely to state my experience and also to give my own analysis on what I think was the root cause or causes of the trouble in Liberia. And I will stand by that. If this country that a lot of people are illiterate, the percentage may be around 75, 80. And things I heard about other what they say, they just conclude that that thing not happen. They don't have the right mind, they're not enlightened enough to be able to analyze between things. So we have the process and I hope to encourage other to come so their own side of the story can be heard. Because if not so, it will look like what they're saying about them is true until they themselves can come and clarify it. Others that have not been able to appear to the TROC, I will encourage them to come. And lastly, as I said, uh, I wish to see the government that will bring all our people together, being the native, being the one we still call the Congo, or the uh, descendant of the settlers, and all of that, that will bring them together 
to unite us as one people. Now, we're at a certain point in time, all of us that oh, uh, we're not allowed to vote and we're not allowed to seize power. So somebody can say again, Native woman born so you and so you kill to war and so you talk war government and all of that. When you listen to those remarks, I remark that uh, the denial of participation brought on to us. And I would like to say that uh, we want a government that will bring everybody together. Everybody, everybody together. Your own you able to do, they should give you the responsibility to do it. And lastly, I want to let the Liberian people know that the war in this country are participated in it in so many areas and serve various positions. As much I'm convinced by myself that personally I've never committed crime against anybody. And I commend the truth. War is not something that is sweet. War is not something that people change. It's where people are killed and other people die. Even people that follow me, they die and God wounded. And people that I fought against, some God wounded and some die. Even civilians in which country or area we fought, some then God wounded, some die. I would want to say in a general manner, especially the Liberian way, I'm very sorry for this incident. I'm very, very sorry. I tell them no more ma. Uh, there are some days that how much I all of feel that we did something or we fought and there are people that there are some days in my life too when I sit down I see people that die as friends to me I can really weep uh, like I show example the late James Coldplay up to today I can't see a way that we let a children go that was the first person in the revolution that I consider a father from local County and since he died uh, that time up to today his children are with me and we want for us to understand that there are a lot of things that happen. The only way we can move our country power is to forgive one another. Thank you very much. Thank you. We may kind of leave with the thanks of the commission. I gave a rough job. I believe I will give you a copy of it. I will give you saw me making some writing and corrections on that. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I want to appreciate the commissioner very well. I beg you, I don't want to leave from here without saying that. How much as we feel some of the things we hear is, is, is high, it's is, is, is like in our own security time, it's a raw data that not need to be consumed by public, it must be investigated and all of that. You are doing a very pretty job. And we hope, it's all of our prayer, if somebody really will enjoy Liberia. I don't think I should have already said and myself in the same age group. I think we the one that you're doing all the things you're doing for. We are very young and if peace is ready in this country, we will enjoy it. So you're doing a very good work. You're keeping up. It will be some time. Some of the commissioner will be insulted and all of that. I want for you to take courage. Yes. So you can continue your work. Nothing should detract you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So you will give us subsequently your... Uh... Yes. I say I will, I will, I will okay. give my number to him. I will get in. I will bring this out. Just a small little correction. And I will give it to him back tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. So I get my number to him. Mr. Yeah, officer. Uh, we haven't received any notice or excuse from any of the other witnesses. Moses Guan, Mohamed Kane, commonly known as Bar Blood, Mohamed Keita, known as Totobun, Mohamed Kere, known as Pupu Skata, Momo Jiba, you see around, Bulldog, Morris Morris, Town Devil, Morris C, Moses Pan, Joe Twa. Twice, yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, please. Welcome and thank you. <clears throat> Are you still prepared after? All this time, I guess. Were you here all day today? 
Yeah, good. But man came here all day to win it to do it. Oh. Sorry, we didn't know you were you were here. We thought it was only. Yeah, Come on, I'm not getting you. Yeah, I was saying. Please clip the microphone on the witnesses' lapel. Yes. Sir.